The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences. These are real people sharing very real, deeply personal experiences. This content may be considered triggering for others and for those who are sharing. The chat room is a privilege intended for discussions and sharing. You are not being asked to agree, but you are being asked to stay civil and refrain from personal attacks. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for coming back to Am I Mental? A live podcast where people share stories about how mental health impacts life and life impacts mental health. I'm your host, E, and with us, as always, is our co-host, C. Hello. And Jay is back from vacation, but has got the Rona, so will not be joining us today. That's okay, didn't want her with us anyway. I hope you're listening, (laughs) and I hope you feel better soon. You and your husband and your kids, because, I mean, all being pent up in the house together, summertime... Rona, I, oh god, <laughs> I can't think of anything worse. So, if you want to help us out, you know, the best way to do that is to share episodes. Um, if you, Especially if you find one that resonates with you or you think will resonate with someone that may be going through something. Um, our podcast has been uh, credited with saving some lives. And um, if it's, you know, someone that you care about and they're in a lot of trouble, obviously we want them to go and get therapy. But if they just need a point to just kind of listen and to realize that they're not alone, share an episode with them. Um, other than that, if you want to help us out even further than that, uh, you can go to um, mimental.net slash donate. There's a number of ways you can help us out. Every penny goes right back into uh, this podcast. And we also have some swag on uh, the Spring Tea store. So check it out. And if there's anything that you would like us to make that's not there do it i mean we still have masks rona's still a thing um we have tote bags hoodies stickers we don't have coffee cups no one's requested that yet and i'm just like i don't drink a lot of coffee so i'm not gonna make one (laughs) and no one's requesting it so whatever (laughs) so yeah um definitely appreciate all the the support that we get from you guys now without further ado we have the guest why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself all right. Hi, I am. Can I use my full name? Doesn't it, matter. It's up to you. You're like we use pseudonyms because, like, I like some anonymity. But we've had people use their yeah. full names. Um, and don't forget, there is the video is just for us. They can't okay. see you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Christine. I am a licensed psychologist. Um, I've been licensed for almost two years now, um, and I work both in a facility and I do a part-time private practice. Nice. And your degree is? I have a PsyD, so it's a doctorate in psychology um, in clinical forensic psychology. Nice. And uh, I mean, a lot of the the therapists that you'll get out there, uh, like your licensed clinical social workers, nowhere near the education that you have. Yeah, they have the social workers get a master's. And then we have to go on and do our doctorate. So we do have a few more years of education and just different experiences. Right. So um, what got you interested in this? Um, so I feel like it's the same thing that a lot of people say. I, I was really interested in why people do what they do. So I actually took a psychology class in high school and I had a great teacher, the way that she just explained everything. I was like, this is the most interesting class I've ever taken. Uh, And from then on, I was like, I want to do this. Um, So I watched, yeah. So it started in high school and then I watched a lot of uh, Criminal Minds. (laughs) So there's the forensic (laughs) aspect. Okay, okay. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So I was like, oh man, is this a real thing? I want to like... I really want to get to know like the motivation behind why people do what they do and why they think what they think and like where all this comes from. And so I just, I just went with it and I started taking psychology classes um, and it was just, it was interesting. I, I hated school growing up. 
And so to have a subject that I really liked, that I was interested in, that I, that made sense to me, I was like, this is, this is fantastic. That made you want to go to school? Yes. Yes. So it was, uh, it was completely like, it completely changed how I viewed school, how I viewed, um, just what I could do in life, you know? So, um, because, you know, if you want to be a psychologist, you got to get higher degrees. And so, um, I was like, I have to go to school. So you know what you need to do? When all is said and done with tonight's episode, you have to send it to your high school teacher. (laughs) I don't (laughs) even know if she's still teaching, but... You can find her on Facebook if she's on Facebook. I found my old, uh, my junior high band instructor. Greatest band instructor I ever had. And during the time that I had her, I hated her. (laughs) But she really drew the best out of us. And then I went and got another conductor after her in high school, like two other ones, and they were just nowhere near the same level. And I went back, I gave her a big old hug and apologized for everything. And yeah, we're still in contact to this day. Okay. I might have to try that. I mean, teachers love to hear, just, I mean, just anybody in general loves to hear that they help to influence somebody's life for the better. That is true. That is true. And she definitely made a huge difference. That's awesome. So yeah. like, what's the, what kind of like is the workload to get to where you are? <laughs> so um, you have to get your bachelor's degree in psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which is where most people wash out that I've noticed. Like I, I can't count how many people I've heard going into college going, I'm going to be a psychologist one semester in. I'm not going to be a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because a lot of it depends on the program. So a lot of the degrees are um, bachelors of arts, but my program that I went to was a bachelor's of science. So it was more research focused, uh, which is not really what you think about when you think about psychology, you think about like talk therapy more. Um, and so it was really heavily research based. Um, so we had to participate in research programs um, we had to be participants. We had to do actual research at a bachelor's level, which is very unusual. Um, but also, it's not very, like, the bachelor's psychology is not very specific. And it doesn't really teach you, like, how to do therapy. So it's more a lot of, like, he- really heavily theoretically based. Okay. And so you're learning. You're learning more like the theories. You're learning more about like the major players in psychology and you get more of just a really general overview. So you can become a really good amateur psychologist to the point of where like you're noticing things about yourself, about your family, about, you know, the people that you're around, but it doesn't, you don't really get anything that you can actually use in a career when you get your bachelor's degree. And I'm sure that when you get your bachelor's degree, there's that uh, problem known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> Are you familiar? No. Dunning-Kruger effect is one of those things where it's it starts out low. It's like you have no information about something, so you don't feel very smart. And then there's this quick spike up what's called Mount Stupid, which is you... No more than the average person, but you really don't know what you don't know. So you have yeah. no idea. Yeah, so you feel like, I know all this stuff. I'm really smart about this. And then you fall down into the, the – where it's like as you start to learn, you're like, holy crap, I don't know shit. And that's yeah. called the Valley of Enlightenment, which slowly slopes back up uh, over time to being, okay, now you actually have the confidence and the knowledge – but you at least, but you also know what you don't know. You have a very good yeah. understanding of where you stand. So yeah. it sounds like that bachelor's is the, the peak amount stupid. You have uh, a bachelor's degree, yeah. you know more than most, but you still don't know what you don't know. Yeah, and it's so funny because a lot of like clients that I have in my private practice, they are into psychology, so they take like psychology classes. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know this from my psychology class, and like they'll try and diagnose themselves with stuff. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, that's like lower level stuff, but <laughs> and like I don't want to be a jerk about it because right. they're trying and they're trying to understand. But it's like it's you're right. It's like you know you know a lot more than a lot of people, but when you're trying to take it and apply it to yourself, that's when it all goes bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that is it says you know it's like you know it's 
like when you're crazy, everybody else seems crazy and you seem fine. Yeah. So if you try diagnosing yourself and you're not of the right mind, you're not going to properly diagnose yourself. Right. And it's always the crazy ones that are like, I'm not crazy. Yeah. And so, right? But literally yeah. the entire world is. <laughs> yes, and everybody else that has the problem. Yeah. And that's something I learned the hard way, which is when the whole world seems to have a problem, it's you that has the problem. Yeah. Yeah, usually that's how it works. you got to look at the common denominator. Yeah, <laughs> it just it takes it takes humility to be able to accept. Yeah, I'm the common denominator. Oh yeah, nobody wants to admit that they're the problem. That's it's hard, and then that means that you're the one that has to change. Right. So yeah, um, like what was it, say let, when you got into your the doctorate program? Yes. What was your workload like? Because I mean. A lot of people will know what it's like for an associate's, for a bachelor's. A good chunk can you know, see or conceptualize a master's degree. But beyond that, like for me, I don't even have an associate's. So I can't oh. even imagine what your <clears throat> workload would have been like. So it's like having a full-time job that you never get to leave. Oh, no. Essentially. So because... you're shackled. <laughs> Basically. Because, so you've got your classes and... The program that I was in, they had it all, like, your classes are pre-picked out for you. So you have these classes this semester, these classes next semester, to try not to overwhelm you. But you have, so you have the classes, and you go to the classes, but then you have the most amount of reading that you've ever done in your life for every single class. So Mm. it's like... It's not just like a chapter. It's like two, three, four chapters. And there are 50 pages each. And then you have to write papers on them. Or you have to find articles and present the articles. And it's just, it's an it's more work than humanly possible. So they're like, we don't want to overwhelm you. And then proceeds to overwhelm you. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, so it is, it's a huge commitment. It's a huge workload. Um, that is, it's essentially a full-time job. Um, and I made the mistake because I thought like I could do it all. Um, I tried to have a job while I was doing that too. <coughs> that, and I succeeded, I think for the first year, I think I had a job, um, cause I worked overnight. So that was my justification. I'm working overnight. So I can work on my homework while doing, work. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you know just have a completely messed up sleep schedule and be exhausted the rest of the week. So, but it is it's it's a lot of work and it's a really big commitment. So a lot of um, you see a lot of people not finish the program because you go in with this idea of what you think it's going to be because you know you handled the bachelors some people went in with the masters already so they're like i know what the workload's going to be um without really realizing it is a huge commitment huge commitment and not just like not with time but like money if you can't work you that's what three four years of your life that you're not getting any kind of income so it's it's financial a huge financial burden too that you have to consider when you're doing it so yeah, I got to help my wife get her. Um, she has an, is it an associate's or a bachelor's in nursing. I'm bad, but uh, I helped her to get her, you know, her license for nursing, and that was a hell of a commitment. You know, what you're talking about is like magnitudes worse. Because <laughs> I mean, my my joke was for the next two years. I even said this at the beginning of nursing school. Like they, I was there with her class. And they were expl- like they, the the instructor was explaining what life is going to be like. So like so basically, for the next two years, it's going to be as if my spouse has died, and her ghost is rummaging through the refrigerator and cabinets every once in a while. But don't be freaked out because she will rejoin the living in two years. And the, she laughed and yeah. said, "Yeah, that's basically it." <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very accurate <laughs> depiction. <laughs> So, sorry, Christine is dead and will be dead until she gets her doctorate. And then she'll return to the land of the living. 
Don't uh, oh. and don't freak out when she kind of looks peers outside and goes. So that's the sun. <laughs> what? What is that? Th- this this is family, and these are people. <laughs> what? What? No, no, so, it's a dream. So I did get a question from uh, Michael, um, someone that we're related to. Yes. So Christine and I, just for full disclosure, we are cousins, which is awesome. And yes. another cousin just asked if you're state licensed. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so when someone is licensed, they have to, there's two tests that you have to take. So one it's called the EPPP and I forgot what that stands for because it was so traumatic trying to pass it. <laughs> um, and, um, and so that's like the nationwide, everybody who wants to practice psychology has to pass the EPPP. And then once you pass that, then you go through the state to pass a te- another test to get licensed in that state. So I am licensed only in the state of California. Got it. So, yeah. So if I wanted to practice elsewhere, I would have to be like supervised or I would have to go and then take their licensing test. So I just looked it up. E triple P is the examination for professional practice in psychology. Yes. And of course, there's someone out there going, well, should that be EPPS? No, psychology starts with a P. <laughs> <laughs> Much like what I try to do in the middle of the night, the P is silent. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and someone in the chat just said name dropping now, question mark. Um, yeah, his name is Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! That's awesome that he, he he's in the chat now. <laughs> and Michael, oh shit, that is Christine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a family affair. Oh man! Not even kidding. The uh, like out of the top three shows for listenership that we've ever had. One of them was when my dad was on and talked about the crisis that surrounded me being born. Oh. You see, my mom almost died uh, and with me because of placenta previa. And the hospital that they went to in Wairika, uh was considered barbaric because they still use an alcohol drip to stop um, contractions. Two <laughs> liters of alcohol. I'll send you the episode if you're interested. Yes, please. Yeah, it was my and my dad. If, if you've ever listened to him do a speech or tell a story, he's like Mister Ballin. He will just he's enthralling. Yeah. And there's Cat E's dad is cool <laughs> in the <laughs> chat. And so far in our chat, we have Cat, Bexy, and Greg. And um, driving through text messages to me is Michael. But he's like, I'm driving. I really hope that you're doing voice to text because. (laughs) Be safe out there, Michael. I still want your wife on the show, too. I know you're listening. (laughs) So you go through all that work. You, You rise from the dead. You now, yeah. So you now have your degree. You now have your license. Because I remember I wanted you on the show back, like you had just graduated. Like this podcast had just really wasn't even a year old yet. Yeah. And you're like, no, I'm just like, I just finished the education part. I need to get my career going. I'm like, okay, that's cool. So here yes. we are, a couple of years later. Now that your career's yes. going, you want to do the podcast now? <laughs> <laughs> no. But here you are, anyway. <laughs> um so where did you go first? Like what was your your um basically get your feet wet? So they do a really good job in graduate school about kind of getting your feet wet and practicing with supervision. So that's the thing about psychology and with uh, actually a lot of professions, but they make sure you are supervised so much while you're going through the process to ensure that you're getting the your kind of be able to apply the book stuff to real life because what's in the books is very different than what you actually do. And it looks very different when you put it into practice. So 
uh, we had practicums uh, starting in our second year, I think. Um, no, starting in our first year, the second half of our first year, we started doing practicums um, at different places. So some were like doing assessments. We did one out of school, um, doing like uh, the IEPs, the individual education program for plans um, for, for kids. Then we did um, different ones that we actually did therapy in, um, some more assessment type stuff. So you get a lot of different experience going through graduate school. And then before you graduate, you have to do an internship. Um, and you have you have to do 1,500 hours supervised of an internship past that before you can actually graduate with your degree. You ready, so, for, you ready for this? <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, the, um, that in California, we have our own certification for, um, being a certified sterile processing and, uh, distribution tech. Yes. You have to have a thousand hours, uh, of an externship. <laughs> <laughs> wow. A thousand hours. A thousand hours on an externship yeah. to clean shit. <laughs> but no, <laughs> again, pretty much anything <laughs> medical is going to be extremely supervised because we're yeah. talking about people's health. You know, I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not separating mental health from physical health because they're kind of intertwined. Mm-hmm. Just, just a lot. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you get supervised, you get supervised a lot. I'm um, going through this process to and because once you do the 1500 hours and get your degree, you have to do another 1500 hours after you graduate. So, so 3,000 hours. So 3,000 total hours. But the ki- because you're graduated and you have your degree, you're not getting paid internship wages. You can actually, like, make some money and, you know, start living again, not eat ramen no more. <laughs> I could put eggs in my ramen now. <laughs> yes! Yes, you can get fancy. Uh, so so that's, that's the whole process. So you have to do the 1,500-hour internship graduate and then do the 1500 hour postdoc hours and then you can sit for the first licensing test so that's the that's the whole process nice in a nutshell yeah well before i forget if you want to plug your private practice go right ahead like if you have openings or whatever we used to we had a uh, psychologist that was on the first couple seasons regularly and we'd plug her all the time but then she closed her private practice. She's like, yeah, oh, I, she's like, yeah, I'd rather be with my family. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I was like, if anyone's going to understand that, it's going to be someone with a private practice. <laughs> yes, yes. It's hard. It's hard doing both, but um, it, I found it necessary. But that's a little supplemental cold, cold. income. Not, not the income, not the income. So. Uh, I got my internship at a prison, right? And that's where I, I got hired on after I did my internship, and that's where I stayed. Um, but you don't really do treatment at a prison. Um, the way that it's set up, especially, you know, being in California, there's so many lawsuits and so many just people, hands in it, that you don't really do treatment, and yeah. you don't really get to see real progress because – Again, because the way that it's set up, a majority of the people in the mental health program aren't mentally ill, right? Or so you don't, you just don't get to do treatment. You don't get to see progress. You don't get to actually use what you went to school for, which is really hard. It's hard to come to that realization that the career path you've chosen, you don't use any of your schooling. Wow. Uh, So... I mean, you can bits and pieces here and there, but it's not nearly to the level or to the degree that you really want to, right? And so, because a lot of it is paperwork. So you don't spend a lot of time with the actual patient. You spend more time doing paperwork. So, <coughs> um, and I So you're in, a glorified secretary that does a little much. bit of psychology. Yeah, pretty much. Like I'm a I'm a risk assessment manager. I mm. think is is a really good way to put it. Um, and so I 
I work in a crisis unit and it sounds really weird to say that I don't make a difference in a crisis unit, but there's a lot of manipulation. Like there's a lot of, um, I don't want to be here. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to say that I'm suicidal and go here. Um, and then just kind of hang out. You mean the patients are manipulative? Yes. Yeah. So, so I found that it was very unfulfilling work and I was like, you know, it's, it's a good job as far as looking at the practicalities of paycheck benefits, stability, it's all there. So I find, and it can help me pay off my student loans. So there's for practical reasons, it's, it's a good place to work, but I didn't find it fulfilling in any way, shape or form. So that's why the and, private practice. <laughs> yes. So I started up the private practice. And I never thought that I would be happy and okay with like sitting in an office for eight hours, listening to people talk about all their problems, but it, it's amazing. I love it. I was going to say, you were fascinated with how people work. I can't think of a better situation. (laughs) I, well, I liked doing like assessment type stuff. I felt like I got more information doing an assessment on someone because then you really get like the deep down stuff that they won't share with you. Uh, but I, I am totally 100% in, invested in private practice now. I love it. So that's what basically your private practice is what you went to school for. Yes. Yes. And it's, it's so interesting because I had been at the prison for three or four years already. Um, and I just waited to get licensed until I was licensed to start up the private practice. And so I felt confident, you know, in, in my skills and my ability. But then I started the private practice and I felt a whole new sense of imposter syndrome going on again. God, I hate yeah. imposter syndrome. <laughs> right? and it's gotta be really weird when no. you're a psychologist, you know what it is. And you're like, Yes. This is irrational. I know it's irrational, but I still feel it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's and it's crazy. It's a crazy thing because you have all of this these years of experience and skills and and schooling and like a ton of resources that you've gathered along the way, but it's it's one of those where it's I'm 100% on my own and 100% responsible for these people's mental health well-being. And that that's scary, right? And that I think that was had a lot to do with the imposter syndrome of it's my job 100% now to help these people with these problems that they have. You don't have a supervisor anymore, right? <laughs> no supervisor, no co workers, no none of that. Um, so <laughs> it please, was, it was very intimidating. Please tell me that you've gotten to like some kind of a network with others that have private practices oh. that you guys can share. Yes. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. There is definitely I gonna say, I, I was going to say there has to be at this point because yes. my God, if there wasn't be like, you guys are missing a hell of an opportunity here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. So there's, we, there is a network and we do talk and, and work through a lot of stuff together. Um, so it, it definitely helps with that. And, you know, after the first couple of, of clients, after the first couple of sessions, it, that goes away because it, you, you gain more of the evidence of, okay, I can do this. I can do this. It's not a complete disaster. All right. So Michael just asked, how did you get your private practice started? Oh man. Um, it was a lot of work. <laughs> So there's a lot that goes into private practice that I didn't even realize uh, because it's a lot of, um, of like logistical stuff. So you have to have like an NPI number, which I think you get when you start at, at the prison um, or you, you can just sign up for it. So you have to get a number, you have to get tax ID, you have to fill out like the tax paperwork, um, get depending on if you want how you want to to create the private practice um if you want to take insurance you have to get on insurance panels Uh, so you have to like fill out a ton of paperwork um, and then they say whether or not they need providers in that area Um, if you choose not to do uh, 
insurance, then you can do cash only, but it is a lot harder to get clients that way because a lot of people have insurance pretty, I, yeah. pretty much everybody has insurance and they want to use it, right? Nobody wants to pay however much right. you're charging. And it's like, I'm already paying for insurance. <laughs> I don't want to pay out of pocket too, except for the right? copay. Right? Exactly. I mean, that I, I get that. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Although yeah, I, I will say that I am paying out of pocket for, yeah. Okay, so uh, again, we talked about it briefly on last week's episode. I am with BetterHelp.com. I get my first session on Tuesday. I'll let people know how it goes. They don't work with insurance. Most of them, some of the pro- uh, the providers that they can work with insurance, you just have to talk to them on an individual basis. But as far as when you sign up, there's no insurance. So, and you pay for four weeks at a time up front. So it's, it's not cheap, but, um, for what I'm paying, it's not much more than the co-pays were anyway. So it's not that big a deal to me. That's pretty good. Like my, right. co- like my co-pays fluctuated depending on where I went and what my insurance was between 15 and 25 per session. Uh, I'm paying 37 per session. That's really not a big difference. That's really good for them not taking insurance. Yeah. It's like, they got to be getting money somewhere else somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And they sponsor too. So they're, they're like giving out. I mean, it's like, uh, like Mr. Ballin, <laughs> they are sponsoring him. He gives referrals and he gets paid for it. Wow. Me, if I give a referral, I get a free week. <laughs> and the person I refer gets a free week. Wow. So there's that little part of me going, you know, I should throw it up on the podcast website and see if I can't get myself a couple of free months. But <laughs> it's like, yeah, but that doesn't help anybody else. That doesn't go to the podcast. That's really, no, that's not the purpose of it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's good. I'm like, I'm shocked that that's all you're paying. I'm shocked that's all I'm paying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh... But yeah, those are those are really the steps to starting a private practice and then finding um, finding a place, an office, and then just kind of signing up for different things to get your name out there, so people can uh, so people know that you're there and you can start getting clients. I mean, that's one advantage of accepting insurance is that you get put on their website of. You know, mm-hmm. find a provider in your area through our insurance. Yep. Well, here's Christine yep. in your area. <laughs> right. That's how I've gotten almost all of my referrals. Um, and I only take, right now, I only take one insurance. Um, and I'm full with people calling weekly about spots. Yeah. And that just right there, what you just said, is a testimony to the... I don't know if it's a true crisis in the United States, but we definitely have a mental health problem. Yes. And definitely a shortage in providers because all of the providers I know in this area are like 100% booked. They're full with the same thing. They're getting referrals, multiple referrals weekly. Um, And it seems to really pick up with coronavirus or like after a lot of the restrictions lifted, um, the referrals just came pouring in. I I would have thought it would have been the other way around. Like when the restrictions took effect, that would have been for me the big wave because like a lot of people who are very social are suddenly isolated. Introverts are like, this is great. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of, a lot of people weren't like seeing people. So I, people weren't even trying at that point. And so once, because once things lightened up a little bit, um, that's when I noticed I started getting a ton of referrals. And what were you going to say, C? I was going to say that's exactly how it was for me. Literally only one thing changed in my life, and that was school. Introverts of the world. Let's stay in our own corners, but, you know, unite, you know, metaphorically. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, basically. Basically. Introverts of the world, let's unite and be alone. (laughs) 
let's be alone together in our silence while we do other things in the same room. That's my type of bonding. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice hearing you breathe today. <laughs> Basically, like, it was nice that you're just sitting there while you were doing whatever, and I'm just sitting there on my phone. Great bonding time. All right, so Kat asked... Oh, it was asking me, I guess, an hour or 30 minutes. Um, I don't know how long the appointments are. They booked the appointments two hours apart, so I don't know. It could be a half hour, an hour session, and then the rest is, you know, paperwork for me, getting ready for the next client. I, I don't know. And then Greg asked or Christine, are you going to continue to work at the prison? Uh, yeah, for now. Um, just for a little bit. I, again, the stability and like the student loans is a huge thing. So because inmates are seen as an underserved population, uh, I qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So after a certain amount of time, my loan, the rest of my loans will be forgiven. So that mm -hmm. is a huge benefit. So basically it's like, Hey, a lot of these loans came from, you know, tax dollars. You're helping out people who are also writing on tax dollars. We're going to go ahead and say, you don't owe us any more of those tax dollars. Yes. That's actually, <laughs> that's actually not a bad system, to be honest. Wow. And, and, I mean, I, and I'm as anti-tax as they get, but I'm okay with this. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it helps me out. I, I took the loans knowing that I was going to have to pay them back. I didn't think that this, I didn't think that that was a thing. Uh, so the fact that it does exist, because I'm still making payments. I'm still paying off a, a, ch a good chunk of it. Uh, and so once I make, once that happens, then I probably won't stay at the prison much after that. Um, I, I would probably do private practice full time. And get to do what you went to school for half the time. Yeah, and, because the other half yeah. is paperwork. And, <laughs> right. And it's something, it's something that I enjoy, something that I find, like, fulfillment in. And it's not, like, going into prison every day is incredibly stressful. And so to get rid of that stress, be able to make my own schedule, spend, you know, like, I would be able to do way more activities with the kids. It would just, it would be a huge stress relief. Oof. Yeah, so Michael just sent me a text with the, because, uh, <laughs> again, his wife also has is a doctor of psychology and he just sent me what the, the loan number amount is. And that is, mm. Ooh. Mm -mm. E e mm -mm. Yeah. it's a little bit less than what I paid for my house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, it, it's pretty equivalent. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to throw that out there. What it is because, mm, 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 mm. but it does remind me of the one person who held, held a PhD in theoretical archaeology. And they asked me if I wanted to apply for a Target red card. <laughs> <clears throat> but, to their credit, they paid for their schooling mostly out of pocket with only very few loans. And they did it purely as an intellectual curiosity knowing that there was no career in it and they just wanted to have a cool doc uh, talking point and be able to call themselves a doctor so it's like okay you know if, if you knew that you were doing all this going in and you're going to be responsible for it all more power to you that's freaking awesome right it's just funny that you have to ask me if i want to target red card <laughs> just, yes we, doctor yeah. uh, so are you doctor or do you want fries with that <laughs> And Kat said that um, with the whole lockdown thing that uh, they discovered that I'm not as hermit-like as I thought. And also said that uh, the whole thing with the, you know, serving in an underserved community that helps to pay off your loan is a great benefit. Mm hmm Absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. You mean, I, I work with these people over here that I may not be fully comfortable being around but I get to basically pay off a house worth of debt after a few years. Where do I sign? <laughs> okay. okay. I can do that. <laughs> Look at that mountain of debt. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a few years. I got this. 
do I have to be locked up too for that time period? Because I'll do it. <laughs> Almost got the water out the nose. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's taking it a little too far. <laughs> Just a little too far. I don't think I'd, I, I, I don't want to be locked up with them. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, you'd be in solitary. <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> So, um, I know you can't, you know, cause, like HIPAA, you can't go into any, like, details about your clients that could identify, but, like, what are some of the more odd things that you've seen? Because I know uh, you could talk so- about incidents, but not the person. <clears throat> are you talking, do you want, like, prison stuff or private practice stuff? Because com- completely different. Okay, how about, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, some of the more like stuff that I never wanted to deal with, um, at the prison the other day, I was doing a check-in cell side, um, and I started to get like a whiff of something kind of funky and I was like, hmm, hmm, that's, that's really, somebody stinks down here. I was like, maybe they need a shower. So I'm talking, I'm talking and it's getting stronger and all the custody officers are kind of coming down the tier. And I turn around and the cell behind me is the windows are completely covered in shit, just shit all over. And I see the guy, he's like trying to make artwork out of it. Just really calm, just smearing, smearing his feces all in the window. And I'm like, this is actually fairly common. My sister, you know, my sister, she's a correct officer and she talks about this particular thing all the time. Right. I don't understand because it's, it's disgusting. It's so gross. And it's like, okay, that's cool. Like, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go now and probably go throw up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. And it's like, it's just another day. And cause, and then as I'm leaving, all the officers are like, oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he does that all the time. You like that? That was for you. Oh, thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesome. The blue collar <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> you're right? you're thrown into it. Right. So, so <laughs> Greg did ask a question that actually is one that I, I'm very curious about as well. It's like, once you're able to leave the prison, will you move closer to your parents? Oh, good question. Uh, Seriously, that's a really good question. <laughs> not, not what I was expecting. Um well, I mean, you got to, I mean, you're my dad and your dad, they've been hanging out a lot more lately. I know. A lot of golf I together. I, that's a very good thing though. Yes. And after everything that your dad's been through, it is great that he still has the ability to go out and golf and have a life. Yes. Yes. I'm very thankful that he has that. He has people that he can go and do that with. I think that it is fantastic and one of the best things for him. And I need to go visit him. I miss your parents so much. Yeah, you do. You're like right there too. Yeah, that's the worst. That's what makes it harder is that <laughs> oh, we're right there. You know, I can just go anytime, and then yeah, you never but, go. Kind of like right. when I lived in Mount Shasta. Yeah, I'll hike the mountain someday. <laughs> yeah, I don't live there anymore. <laughs> and my ankle's too hey. fucked for that now. <laughs> um, probably not. Not that I don't love my parents, and I would love to be around them more. Um, but I. I would probably, if I were to move somewhere, I'd probably elect to move out of California. I, I hear that. I, I feel that one deep. Yeah. yeah. And also, I so, mean, but just, just moving alone, you'd have to get rid of all your clients. Unless yes. they decide to go remote. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you'd have to main, especially if you go to another state, you'd have to maintain a licensing in two states. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I mean... That's another logistical nightmare right there. Yes, yes. And on top of that, I live in a beautiful place. So yeah, you do. <laughs> it's, I mean, 20 minutes from like five beaches. So I can't, I can't really complain about that too much. So all the cousins that are listening, we should do our cousin reunion down there. And there's, there's another reason besides that too, which I'm sure Christine will tell eventually. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> because you have to be a part of it. I would. I. I really want to. I. Yeah. I really want to be a part of that. Well, if you can't come to the reunion, the reunion should come to you. I'm. I'm okay with that. So am I. 
Plus, I just love okay. the area. <laughs> I, I can I can sell it. I can really sell it too about about the area. And my wife's like, "Wait, so you're going for our birthday time?" I'm like, "Well, our birthday is in the first week. I think this is going to be later in the month." <laughs> see, there you go. I'm looking to see. We're not getting any more questions. <laughs> but my dad loved the idea. I asked him because, like, he comes in the first comment. It's a blank default silhouette you know, avatar picture. Next comment he makes, it's a picture of my mom and dad together. Next comment it makes, it's just him. I'm like, are you going to change pictures for every comment? He's like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> oh, no. I hear you playing with an aminal. Yep, my kitty cat. Meanwhile, I have my yellow lab asleep on my feet and Buster sleeping on the couch. <laughs> the, the beagle. Aww. He's laying down right next to me. He right. was underneath my bed sleeping. All right, so private practice. What's the some of the weirdest stuff you had seen there? You said it's a totally different world. Um, it's, uh, it's a little I don't know, disappointing that I haven't really seen a lot of weird things in private practice. Well, um. I would think that part of it could also be that people who seek out therapy or have a little more self-awareness yes. as opposed to they're being forced to see you. Yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah, that is, it is a big difference there because the people that come into private practice typically want to be here. And so I think the, I think the, the weirdest thing that happens in private practice is like, working on the same thing with multiple clients at the same time to where it just kind of like all falls in line where we're working on like this client shares something that I'm like, Oh, we really need to work on like codependency with, with you. And then next client comes in and it's like, Oh wow, we really need to work on some codependency stuff with you too. And it happens like all in the same week. So it's like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, wow. Yeah, so it's weird how like things kind of fall into into line like that, um, but that's I think that's like the weirdest thing that happens in private practice. That's <laughs> yeah, and I was just thinking about the times I've been through private practice, and it, sometimes they're like, yeah, I just like um, I went to one and uh, was assigned the grief recovery handbook, which. I I mean we that thing's been mentioned so many times on this podcast it might as well be we might as well be sponsoring it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it was absolutely a life changing book for me. Uh, and what it was is that she happened to have a number of clients all in the same that came in and they all were like having grief issues all at the same time. So she's like went out and bought this book in bulk because it helped her. And then she's like, okay, well here you go, fifteen dollars. This book is yours, and we're going to work through it together. And yeah. It, it was uh, awesome. It just kind of lined up like that. Yeah. So it, yeah, things. It's it's interesting to see just how things line up, and it's it's. It, I think it's fun. I I enjoy it, and it makes it's kind of weird because it makes things easier. Because it's like, yes, we're all working on codependency. Yes, we're all working <laughs> on anxiety or like a certain coping skill. So it's like it makes it my job a lot easier trying to not have to remember 15 different things. No. <laughs> no, my dad just threw a picture. He's making a face. all like, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's where I get it from. <laughs> um, and actually, I had one doctor. He was a doctor in psychiatry. So it's, you know, different part. You know, because like you do the I think the more how it all works and he's more of the let's maintain and keep it working more the medical side of it where you're more yeah. of the let's, you know, the tinkering around inside of people's line of reasoning and all that. Yes. And one thing that he did is he has a, he does a built in OCD test for his patients. Every time you go in to see him, he will make one minor change with his office to see if you spot it. I only spotted one change once. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you're not. A... He's like, I've left a, a file cabinet drawer partway open after pulling something out just to see if it bothered you. And you were like completely unfazed. Like, I have my little issues of little things that's got to be right. 
but not like everything has to be right. Yeah. And even when I realize I have those little things that have to be right, I deliberately try to make myself uncomfortable by making it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want to fall down the OCD tunnel. I've seen people with OCD. That is a life destroyer. It is rough. OCD is rough. There is one person I remember who (laughs) their OCD and anxiety really focused on germs. So going to the bathroom was one of the most uncomfortable things for them because the bathroom is a filthy room. And if you ever go in with a black light, you will agree. (laughs) Just saying. Um, They deliberately were told to be late to come to class once. The anxiety side of things. Told, you have to be late. We'll kick you out of the program if you come in on time or early again. Wow. And it's like, but, oh, but, God. but. And it's like, uh, it's like, you know, you would think that, okay, I have permission to be late. But their whole thing was, everybody else will know that I'm late and they, and they're not going to tell anyone. Yep. Yeah, C gets it. You get it. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> at first I was like, okay, you're being told to be late. What's the big deal? It's like everybody else's perception. <gasps> oh. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't for, care. <laughs> yeah, for someone with anxiety like that, it's At huge. that level, yeah. It is. Like, I have my own, so, I have anxiety in crowds. Like, people are, hey, let's go to the Aftershock Music Festival. I'm like, I would rather suck start a pistol. Thank you. <laughs> that That is not happening. Uh, even though it's like, I look at the headliners, I'm like, man, I'd love to see that band. I'd love to see that band. I'd love to see that band. Bucket list band, bucket list band. I am not going to Aftershock. Just that is not happening. <laughs> it does not sound appealing to me to be in a group that's tens, if not you know, like tens of thousands of people with multiple stages oh, no. in hundred degree weather. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I'd rather have a tooth extraction going up my rectum first. <laughs> to be honest, with no wow. anesthesia. That that's how uncomfortable. The idea of going to Aftershock is for me. It's hard enough for me to go to a concert like um, like there's this awesome amphitheater up in Wheatland. It used to be Sleep Train oh, yeah. Amphitheater. Um, then it became whatever bought whoever bought out Sleep Train, and I don't even know who owns it anymore. <laughs> but it's hard enough for me to go there. Wow. Um, but I will because it's like yeah, um, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna go out in the grass. <laughs> I'm not gonna go in the seats. The grass, there's a little more room. People get, you know, got to get a seat. You're like, you're confined to your seat in half of your armrests. Yeah. Out on the grass, you're like, lay out a blanket. This is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, the acoustics are so good in that amphitheater that being in the grass is really no big deal. Yeah, that's a good theater. Yeah, it's a really good theater. Yeah. I got to see... Def Leppard, Kiss, Soundgarden, and Nine Inch Nails all there. Wow. I haven't seen a lot of concerts there, but I tell you, I I got some really good ones. (laughs) Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, and um, it was great because Paul Staley, you know, the lead man for Kiss, uh, said he he renamed it from Sacramento to Sacramental. And I'm like, man, you have no idea. (laughs) I mean, you live in L.A., you might have an idea, but this is where all the politics are. You have no idea. (laughs) Um, Have you had any clients that you were, that you knew you couldn't help and you had to refer them elsewhere? Um, I have not experienced that yet. Fortunately, usually um, I do like a screening thing before I actually meet with the client. So I'll call them and talk to them on the phone and say, tell me a little bit about what's going on. And I'll tell you how I work and we'll see if we're a good fit. Because I, I think that's a very important thing when you're looking at therapy is you have to have a connection no matter what. Like the, the client has to feel comfortable. I have to feel like I can help this person or like 
they're, I just have to be able to connect with them and make sure that I am in a space to, to actually help them. Um, and so um, there actually, I lied, there was one, there was one that I said I can't work with. And it was because this person was, um, was over 18, but the mom was trying to get this person into therapy because the mom thought that the child was the problem, met with the kid, and I was like, you really don't want to be here. Um, I don't think I can help you anyways because you don't seem to have any problems. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the, the, the subtle way of saying, your mom's the problem. <laughs> and the, yeah. And I, I, right? Trying to like, well, your mom's the one who wants the therapy. Your mom's the one. Maybe you guys should do family therapy. I don't really do family therapy. Um, this is where you can look. Good luck. Um, because I'm not going to keep someone in therapy who doesn't want to be here and who doesn't really need the help. So that was, I think that was the one. And it was, um, it was a very interesting, very interesting experience. I can imagine. I mean, especially if you're, if it's like a, I mean, it sounds like it was just this huge red flag waving. Yeah. The problem's over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, it was, it it's definitely... beginning to sound a lot like narcissism. <laughs> so, uh, there was there was some, a few things, and so it was it, it was definitely challenging in trying to kind of set boundaries and still be like professional and firm, and and ref, like refer and say I can't help you. Right, and uh, Michael just said have to get off. Proud of both of you for your accomplishments and success. Love you guys. Oh, thanks. Aww. Love Michael. you too. Michael's a great kid. I really don't think that he's related to his other brothers. I think it's just, you know, I think he was adopted. <laughs> don't tell him that, though. Oh, he just heard it. <laughs> well, he'll hear it when it gets to him because there's a delay of like about seven or eight seconds. So he heard it now. <laughs> <laughs> I love my family, and I've always said, you know, the more I pick on someone, the more it's because I'm that comfortable with them, and that I really love them, which is why I never make fun of, and I just pick someone at random. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I know we talked about it a little bit there on the pre-show, but, like, what are your forms of therapy? Like, what's your tool set? What do you do? What do I do? I fix people. Um, well, yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of different ways. <laughs> there are. Uh, so I really like cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, looking a lot at thoughts, feelings, behaviors, how they all impact each other and how you can change them to improve how you're feeling, the things that you're doing. Um, and then the dialectical behavior therapy or DBT piggybacks off of that and looks a lot at different coping skills. So I think they complement each other really nicely um, and they can both stand on their own, but I like using them together because while you're going through and trying to change your thoughts <clears throat> um, and change some of the behaviors, it's really helpful to bring in the set of coping skills of things that you can do to manage while you're trying to change all these things because it's a, it's a long process. It can be a really long process and it's really hard. And so bringing in, I think if they balance each other out really nicely. I mean, there's a reason why a lot of those um, like mental health crisis help things like um, I can't even remember the name of a few of them anymore, but it's like they always do six weeks. Well, it takes mm -hmm. about six sessions to really get to know the person um, and be able to go, okay, now I know, what we can work on. I know what coping skills I can help you to help you get through this. Okay. Because I mean, obviously coping is a, you know, it could be good or bad. There could be healthy ways to cope and unhealthy ways to cope. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sure that pretty much everybody can really relate to that. <laughs> but, um, yep. 
Yeah, no, I, I love what you're doing. There. And I actually got a really good question here from Greg. Have you ever worked with someone with a traumatic brain injury? So, yes, actually. When I was in graduate school, one of the practicums that I did was at a neuropsych place. And so I did testing and worked uh, with a, a couple people who had suffered from TBIs. Anything specific, like what you were able to do or like what they were presenting or? Um, I mean, that's something that's of uh, acute interest to me. <laughs> yes, yes, understandably. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, honestly, I didn't have a lot of the skills and the tools that I have now, um, but it was uh, the the thing that that my supervisor really tried to kind of push home was that it takes time and it takes like new tools. So like, um, I can't think of the word right now, but like using aids to help with things. So like for memory, like writing things down, doing to-do lists, kind of things like that. So kind of working with where you're at and that, I think that goes for a lot of therapy is kind of meeting the person where they're at. So if they're struggling with memory type stuff, seeing what it is specifically that they're struggling with and the different things that you can implement into your day-to-day program to help with their memory, to help make them as independent as possible. Right. So I think that was, those were the main things that stood out for me. Very cool. And it's like, well, I think that we were talking about, like, um, you've heard of the Anxiety Treatment Center up here. And, you know, yes, I talk about it a lot because I had a very personal experience there and it was amazing. It gave me a lot of tools to help with my day to day, even though I'm actually struggling pretty bad right now. But the tools are helping me to get through it. Um, good. A good way to look at cognitive behavioral therapy is like every day you walk through this field. And you always take the same path because there's this beaten path. It's flat. You know every nook and cranny of it. There's nothing in the way, but it takes you to a very unhealthy place. So what you need to do is blaze a new trail that takes you to a healthy place. And it's not going to be easy because you're going to have to plow through all this really tall grass. You don't know what's there. There's things that are going to trip you along the way. And the other is just so familiar, you know, and you're going to knee jerk want to go back to that. But if you keep taking that new path, you keep forcing yourself to take it over and over again, eventually it starts to get worn down. It starts to become smooth. It starts to every little hazard, you know exactly where it is. Every nook and cranny, the grass goes away. You have a well-beaten path and your old path is now overgrown and uh, and not the same anymore. It's not as comforting as it used to be. That's such a great analogy. And it takes time and deliberate you know dedication to i'm doing this yes it takes it takes time a lot of hard work and energy I mean, to, to form that new path you're retraining brain processes that can't be easy right and kind of like the, the the most powerful statement i ever got was from this one psychologist i only got to see once and he was the most impactful psychologist I ever had, but then I had to move. <laughs> you know, so I was in San Diego. He said, put your right hand over to you, like you're out to your right, near your head, palm up. That is the things that happen. Now put your left hand over your left shoulder, palm up. That is the things that you feel about how those things that happen. Now what's in the middle? That's the part that needs to be fixed. You can't help what's coming in from the right, but you can help how you react on the left. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But it requires fixing that part in the middle. And that just blew my mind. (laughs) It is, but it's a really good, when you actually see it, it's a really good visual representation of essentially how therapy works. Yeah. Shit that happens, how you feel. (laughs) (laughs) Because, I mean, let's face it, that's what we, I mean, there's two basic things that our brain does. We're a judgment engine. So when people say, don't judge me, sorry, that's, that can't be helped. It's human nature. Yeah. 
I can act non-judgmental, but I've judged. Everybody has. That's just the way we are. And the other part is we're also an emotion factory, and those emotions are irrational. Yes. They can be rational, like a puppy comes up and gives you a kiss and you feel like, ah, okay, that's a rational, healthy reaction. Yes. Of course, I see a spider and I do that and people are like, that's not healthy. I'm like, why not? It's just a living being. (laughs) Just like a puppy. (laughs) Ooh, so my interest in insects, is that abnormal? What is normal? Boom. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It, it might be weird, but and it's maybe not. It's not culturally culturally accepted here. Yes, there's other cultures. But... I'm sure that they're like, oh, that's the greatest things ever. <laughs> Hell, there's uh, cultures out there that that's their primary protein uh, food source. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess when you go for normal, you kind of have to look at culturally with their own ex- uh, expectations of what is normal. Yeah. It's, wow. Yeah. I never thought of it as a moving target like that before. Oh, yeah. We stay away from normal in therapy. I mean, you wouldn't have a job otherwise. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> the seriousness in your face, though, when you said it. <laughs> Well, it's like, you know, when I worked in tech support, it's like, if things worked as they did in reality, as they did in theory, I wouldn't have a job. Right? (laughs) And Michael just responded because I I responded back to him in a very, you know, appropriate for the family way. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Does anybody else have any questions? Because definitely my dad's been throwing out some good ones. Yes, very good ones. C, do you have any questions? Not that I can think of. Do you go to, like, any conventions or anything? Because I know that those happen fairly often in your profession. Um, I haven't. I don't really have time. I did, when I was doing internship, I presented at the APA convention in Georgia. Um, but that's it. I, I don't have, I really don't have time. It, it time and money. Okay. But that's cool. You presented. Yes. Yeah. So (laughs) me and one of my classmates did a paper, um, on the treatment for victims of sex trafficking and we presented it. Um, and it was, it was an awesome experience. Where's your paper at? Is it in PubMed or somewhere? I'd no, love to we didn't. check it out. <laughs> Excuse me. We didn't actually, we didn't really publish like a full paper. We just did a presentation on kind of a theory of, of a different type of treatment. And we didn't do like research or anything on it. Okay. Um, we didn't get that far. But we just yeah. kind of presented more theory. And dad just said, gotta go. Love you. Love you too, dad. Oh. Good night. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> ease father so like uh what's like what was your theory like what's different like what, okay, well let's just start with what is the current accepted like what they're trying to do and what is it that you're trying that you and your other person proposed uh, i'm curious so, you're asking so many details i haven't thought about in so long <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a, so, I have an insatiably curious mind. That's good. It's good. I, it's just making me think really hard. Uh, that's good. So, that's good. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I just got off of work. What the hell? <laughs> right? Come on, man. Uh, so from what I recall, uh, they were doing more like trauma-informed care of like going off of the... I guess the assumption that the the victims or the survivors viewed what they had gone through as traumatic, which I mean, that, when we from when, the, when we yeah from the outside that makes sense, right? But not all of them view it as being a victim. So a lot of times they're groomed and they're 
they're worked over and they come from like broken homes and they, it's a better life than what they had. And a lot of them, like when you look at dynamics, so like a lot of them fall in love with the pimp and that's why they start doing what they do. They like, they, that's how they get brought in. Right. It's, they think they're in an exclusive relationship. And then the guy says, well, if you love me, you would have sex with my buddy. And if you love me, you would go have sex with this person and this person. And okay, now you need to go on the track and make me money if you really love me. Right. So it's like, it's a process of, of grooming and kind St- of like indo- Stockholm syndrome's real folks. Yes. It's very real. And so sometimes when the girls get out of it, they don't want to. It's one of those where they were part of a bust or they were, you know, the, the pimp got caught or they got caught with a John and so basically it's like their whole <laughs> life is just being blown up. Yes. And so they don't necessarily view it as traumatic. The right? trauma is being taken out of it. Yes. And got I it. mean Right. So when you when you look at it from that perspective, doing trauma informed care isn't gonna be effective because them being thrown into therapy or them being thrown into this new way of life, being taken away from that, that, like you said, that's the trauma. So, so basically it's like, it's like you were a victim and like, no, I wasn't. No, you're like, you're crazy. He loves me. This, that, the other. Yeah. And if you right? keep trying to say you're the victim, you, oh, the opposition's yeah. going to go <laughs> wall. <laughs> exactly. And so we, what we looked at was, doing like the stages of change so it's kind of taking like motivational interviewing and going with a a softer approach of letting like walking them kind of like walking the horse to water is helping them realize that that wasn't healthy that's not good for them and that they need to make a change and so and that the pimp didn't actually love you Yes. Eventually that realization should come. It should. But when you're looking at young girls who don't have like strong family. Yeah. They don't have a strong foundation. Yeah. Then their idea of love and their idea of, you know, what they need to do for love is very skewed. And let's, let's be honest here. It's majority girls, but boys get caught up in it too. That is true. That is true. There is a fair amount. Of males that get caught up into it. Just, just to be fair here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So we looked at at more kind of stages of change and helping them go through those stages of change to understand that they're the ones that need to make a change, that they need to do something different with their life, and that not using like like the trauma talk of victim, survivor, whatever. It's these are experiences that you've had. They're not healthy for you. You need to move. You need to make changes to get out of that lifestyle. Leading with a gentle hand. Yes. Very gentle. I like that. I hope someone yeah. goes out there and st- does a study, you know, based off your paper. I would have liked interesting. to. Yeah. I mean, if you don't get to do it, I hope somebody does and reaches out to you and be like, hey, we're using your paper for the study. Uh, I bet you'd love to hear that. Yes. I know I would. I'd be like, you really? You're using my paper? Me? You're like, here? like, really? <laughs> and you're going to credit me? <laughs> <laughs> right? Wait, wait, what? Well, it's like that whole thing like with physics. You have your theoretical physics and you have your practical physics. Mm-hmm. The theorists theorize it. The practical people try to make it, try to prove or disprove it. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like that relationship. And they always have to cite, you know, Based on the theories and the writings and workings of so and so, we decided to test. Here's the test. Yep. Yep. So I can't. Cool. I can't see how that won't help. Like I really, as long as it's you know the right people. Again, it's the, the right tools for the right job. Right, and it was again. It was something <laughs> that we we would have loved to do uh, if we had had the resources and the time. You know, and instead of just going through internship. Um, it was just not good timing, but it, it's something that's, that's there in case 
we decide to to do that in the future. Well, you might have a little hobby after you get out of uh, the prison. Yes. Yes. There's a lot have, of you're gonna have a little time. You might might as well jump in. Right. And that's another underhelped group. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Huh. Maybe you present that to the state. Go, hey, I have an idea. And do yeah. your and make it do your uh the like the, the project, like the test. Yeah. And have the state pay for it by forgiving loans. If uh, why not? You can always ask. What's the worst they could right? say? No, and I'm okay with that. That would be really cool if that worked out. Like, if you reached out and like, hey, so I worked on this paper. I'm already helping prisoners. I'd like to focus a little bit more on this paper, you know, see if we could do theory into practice. What do you think? It's worth a try. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> did, 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 it ever cross, thought. did it cross your mind before? I got to ask. No, no. Honestly, I haven't thought about that paper um, in years. The, so. the tyranny of the immediate. Right. Makes it to where things like that just don't get seen by, by you like, can't see the forest for all the trees. Yeah. Yes. God, I hate the tyranny of the immediate. Right. It is such an appropriate term for it, too. Because the immediate is a tyrant. Yes, very much so. <laughs> Cats all laughing emoji after you get out of prison. <laughs> After I, after I do my term. Yeah, I serve my time. Yeah. Shoot. Sometimes that's how you got to think about it, though. It's rough. Yeah, but you got to keep that goal in mind. Yes. And if you happen to help a couple people along the way, awesome. Even though yeah. it's not set up to truly help, you never know. It might be like that one high school teacher. You might got that one person that it just sticks. Yeah. You hope. You hope. You tell yourself that, because then it gives you a little bit more purpose. Like, I mean, just hearing the first time hearing that someone was like, yeah, your podcast, you know, I was going to commit suicide and I listened to it. And so now I'm getting therapy and I'm still here. Blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. I was like, I had no idea that that would ever happen. I was just like, Hey, I got this cool idea. Let's help destigmatize mental health and let's help let others out there that are, you know, that are suffering know that they're not alone. You know, as I've often said, is that, you know, your situation may be completely unique to you, which means I cannot put myself in your shoes. However, there's only so many emotions a human could feel. So even though I may not relate to your situation, I can relate to your emotions. Absolutely. And that's powerful. I don't need it's someone to relate to my exact situation. If they can relate to how I'm feeling, that's everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, that's what we fall back on as therapists too, is, you know, I, it, that helps build rapport with a lot of the inmates too, is you don't know what it's like to be an inmate. No, but tell me how you feel about that. Cause I can guarantee you, I know how you feel or not know how you feel, but I can relate to how you feel. You feel angry. Guess what? I felt angry too. I know exactly what that's like. And, and being able to, to relate to them on that level of, yeah, I don't know what it's like to be in prison and I hope to never know what it's like, but I know how, I, I know how it feels to feel like that. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they know what, that's actually something that you, we use a lot in customer service and tech support too. <laughs> the, the big, so the big thing is in, in that career is fix the person, then fix the problem. Because the person's coming in with preconceived notions that, usually don't align with what the actual problem is. It's more their feelings towards the problem and they're going to take it out on you. Yes. Yep. So you gotta, you gotta fix that part first. Little psychology there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's like, you know, I fully understand. It's like, Hey, you know what? I know how frustrating it is to forget a password. I just had to go through the whole reset thing. rigmarole last week myself. It sucks. There you go. And then now they they know that you know what it's like and you're kind of on that, that same level. Except that for me, it was, yeah, I just had to do this last week. 40 times a day for months on end. Yeah, I didn't have to do it last week. But <laughs> it, 
it still imparts the I get it. Because, yes, I have had to do it. You know, if you if, name one person that's never forgotten a password, and I'll I'll find you a liar. Right. Because your default password is not going to work in every situation. There's going to be some place like, well, that's too long, or that's too short, or it's too complex, or it's not complex enough, or you know, just. <laughs> and you shouldn't be using a default password anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually seen my credentials pop up on the dark web a couple times. Yeah, um, my it, my address was published. My per, my home address was published. If Yay. you googled, yeah, I freaked out a little bit because I just found that out not that long ago. Yeah, no, I have a couple no. of uh, agencies that that's all they do is they search the dark web for that kind of information, and when they find it, they'll let me know. So that's a, a great service to have. Yeah. Plus, I've actually come up with a system. So I know every one of my unique passwords because there is a system, but it's not a system that I'm going to share. Or you know, it's like it's it's a good way of doing it is to come up with a system that there's a clue somewhere with each thing that you're dealing with to give it a unique password. Okay, makes it easier to remember. And I'll tell you mine when we get off the air. You know, it's <laughs> my system's so freaking simple, but it works. Yeah. So, do you have any questions or anything? Um, I don't think so. This has been awesome, though. Yeah, and we try. I try to make it fun, informative, just a conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, I like I like listening to you talk. Yeah, and. <laughs> C is usually like one of the quietest people you'll meet. <laughs> so, yeah. And C's been really invested in this episode. It's awesome. I love seeing it. Well, great. Thank you. So actually do you, the quick little background with C uh, was a guest, was our first guest that was a minor on the show. Got the little video of the parent giving express permission for C to be on the show. Uh, was our first show to hit the three hour mark. And Instantly after the show was over, I immediately went to the other co-host, Bexy, who's she had to step down because of Hashimoto's disease. And I just texted her one word, co-host question mark. She replied back, <laughs> yes. Awesome. With, I would say within five minutes, C got the invite to be a co-host on the podcast and has been with us since. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I, I really like it. It gives me something to look forward to every week. That's good. Yeah, and, and C's come a long way in a short time. Like, C was going through some pretty tough shit. And still going through some shit. But I can see the confidence growing every day. I can see the self-accepted self you know, growing every day. It's awesome. C is amazing. Thank you. And C's sense of humor is as fucking wicked as they come. And I love it. <laughs> And honestly, what a lot of people don't know is that sometimes, like, when we have the breaks between seasons, we have done where we get together and we'll share things that we like. Just us, the co-hosts, and me. Like, we did one where we shared music back and forth. We shared TV shows yep. that we love back and forth. Nice. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're a tight-knit little group here. <laughs> That's awesome, though. That's It's good. I think it makes up for a really good podcast. I hope so. I and mean, what's funny is that I had never listened to podcasts before I started this. And I honestly still don't really listen to podcasts. <laughs> and what I get from a lot of people too, is like, this is the podcast that people like a lot of people are like, I don't listen to podcasts, but I listen to yours. So this is the non-podcast person podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Hey, there's got it. If, if, if we have listeners and followers and we have people donating, obviously something's hit doing it, you know? We're doing yeah, something, doing right? Something. It's like, yeah, there's a, I have those dreams that maybe one day we'll make it big and this could be more than just, you know, put every penny back in. Like, we could actually start, you know, have a life where this is what we do. Where I become a professional podcaster and, like, I could launch other podcasts, you know, because I have this income stream coming in. Don't have to have a regular 9 to 5 anymore. That this is it. 
which would be awesome. But if it stays where it is now, that's awesome too. Self-sustaining is a great place. Yeah, it is. And our exactly. listeners are fiercely loyal. Like, my lord, they're amazing. They are. It's kind of, and um, we do, uh, if you, um, if you have Discord, we do have a Discord. So we can actually continue conversations beyond the podcast. Um, it's pretty quiet right now. There's not a lot of people on, but we have a channel that's dedicated just to art. So we share things like music, digital art, hand drawn, like traditional art, uh, poetry, short stories, um, video games that people have designed because I mean designing a video game is a work of art it really is you know if it yeah. could be considered art in any way shape or form it's there we even have the ability we could create channels for specific episodes like if there's like a big discussion going on and we run out of time well let's continue it in the discord and the beauty of about discord is that you can put something in there and you don't have to respond right away it's kind of like text messaging oh. when you have time you can respond okay and you can get to our Discord by going to just mimental.net. Uh, up at the top, there's a bunch of little icons for, you know, like YouTube, Discord, and what that, you know, the socials. Yeah. yeah. All right. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I, I was, like, at first I was like, you know, I wanted to make the website with forums and all this stuff, and the, the forum stuff was just such a pain in the ass. And I was like... <laughs> Just kind of like, the, I think maybe it was C that brought it up, but somebody mentioned, why not just have it as a Discord? Duh. The infrastructure's already done. <laughs> <laughs> All the authentication stuff's already taken care of. I don't need to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just I'm looking at it right now. We have an Anything Goes, Episodes General, Art Exhibit, Suggestions. Um... We have a couple of lockdown channels, like one for guests. So if you've been a guest, there's a little room. So, you know, the guests can intermingle and be outside, you know, that way. Because sometimes you may want to talk to another guest about something, but you don't want it public. That's a yeah. little place to go there. And then there's also the host. It's just us. <laughs> and, of course, because we have to, we have a memes channel. <laughs> Like one here, it's it shows uh, Jason Stratham as a meme. It says, "I wish women understood that men need attention and affection too. They need kisses and cuddles just as much as you do." They're very positive memes. Oh, good. Although I did one about you know, how could J.K. Rowling have ended the Harry Potter series that would have most pissed you off? The final scene is Harry sat in a therapist's office in a psychiatric ward. The therapist tries to convince Harry yet again that he needs to face the reality that his parents died in a car crash. That watching it happen and then being raised by his cruel aunt and uncle who locked him in a uh, cupboard under the stairs often gave him severe mental illness, delusions of grandeur, and hallucinations. That this whole wizard school doesn't exist and he needs to face the truth. Harry stands, shouts stupefy while pointing a pen at the therapist before bra- grabbing the broom in the corner of the room leaping out of the window be- uh, with it between his legs and plummeting 40 feet to his death. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> so, I actually read a book that was like that. Oof. <laughs> and it was, it was so good. So good. And then the ending hit, and I was like, what? No! Yeah, I mean, if they did that with Harry Potter, that would just be the biggest middle finger to the fan base. (laughs) Speaking of biggest middle fingers to fan bases, looking at you, Sopranos. Looking at you, Game of Thrones. (laughs) Both of those, man, they basically just threw up the birds and, you know, don't care! (laughs) Uh... But yeah, I mean, another thing that we've come to accept that most of us have, you know, when you face hard times, you get a dark sense of humor. It's a coping mechanism. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the beauty of humor is that it helps to make things less scary 
and easier to talk about. So yeah, I embrace dark humor. By all means, bring it. It kind of shows yeah. where you're at, kind of shows what you're going through, and it can help get little clues as to how you operate. All good things. Yes. And laughter is medicine. Oh, yeah. For Most sure. Definitely. This is an awesome meme here, too, that someone sent. I, I found it. Like, there's someone on Facebook, and I totally stole it and posted it in the memes one. It says, one day you will tell your story about how you overcame what you went through, and it'll be someone else's survival guide. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, I, I, I love picking up little jewels of wisdom. Some people call them pearls, but I say they're jewels. <laughs> they're more valuable than a yeah. pearl. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I get that from my dad as well. <laughs> Kat, I think they were just done with Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know there's something really wrong when one of the stars and most memorable characters of Game of Thrones... Quit acting altogether because of how it fucked with him. The kid that played Joffrey is just done. Jeez. The kid that played Anakin Skywalker in um, The uh, Phantom Menace. That's the only movie he ever did. He's done. And it wasn't that the movie fucked with him as much as everybody that knew him, like his classmates and people that identified him fucked with him. That's odd. Yeah, and he's uh, been through a pretty rough patch, you know, prison and yeah. But you see him, he's like, yeah, he's definitely the man that that kid would grow into. Like you could see it. Yeah. <laughs> like that—that that was just a bigger version of that kid with a little bit less baby fat. <laughs> that, that's all it is. <laughs> like he really just grew. That's it. He didn't like my face. I changed. I fucking changed. <laughs> but yeah, no, um. Yeah, I get that from my dad about Little Pearls of Wisdom. Like, that whole thing of don't focus on the waves, focus on the tide. You know, he got that. He shared it. It stuck with me. <laughs> um, there is no knowledge that is not power. Okay, that's cool. But how to identify a male and female cricket, I don't think that's a lot of power. <laughs> <laughs> but I know how. <laughs> I could tell a male and female spider by looking at him. You know what, though? It's perfect fun facts if you ever want to start a random conversation. That is true. And I just got an update from my dad. There are three fires by Oroville. Oh, no. Now, for people outside of California, you may go Oroville. You mean like the TV show? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not the no. Orville, but you may remember that Orville was significant a few years ago. The oh. dam that nearly collapsed and would have been a total catastrophe. Yeah. Now there was also. Oh, sorry. I'll go for go it. On. I was going to say there was also two massive fires over there. Yeah. And now they have three fires right now. Oh, my God. That was crazy. Yeah, when the dam when the dam thing was happening, um, reached out to one of my friends. I was like, "Hey, I know that you live really near the dam. You need a place to stay." <laughs> He's like, "If it breaks, the water's not really not going to affect me, but they're trying to make me evacuate anyway." So sure, the cool. I bring my my mom and my kids. I'm like, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. you can just leave them here. <laughs> no, just leave your son there. He'll be okay. <laughs> Actually, what's funny is I went to um, a birthday party not too long ago, and his son walked up to me and just hit me. He's like, oh. and I was like, "What was that for?" He was like, "For that that uh, gonorrhea scare." And I'm like, "Oh yeah." So what happened is that he had been not feeling well, had specific symptoms. His dad looked them up and saw that they actually coincide with I think it was gonorrhea or chlamydia, one or the other. And he's like, "Hey, so my son went to a specific hospital." Do you think you could give him a call and leave a message to tell him that he has this? I was like, yeah, I have a burner phone number. I could do that. It comes from the same you know, uh, area code. So I totally called up and I disguised my voice just slightly and, you know, told him that. And then his 
freaking uh, Instagram was just blowing up. Just anger, anger, anger. Wouldn't talk to his dad. Wouldn't talk to his dad. And his dad's like, I would let him off the hook immediately. He just has to talk to me. <laughs> so he went through this for like eight or nine hours before finally being told, yeah, we're just fucking with you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so I totally deserve getting hit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, Kat's asking if um, George R. R. Martin's finished the last book. I don't know. I actually never... I didn't read the Game of Thrones. Um, there's basically, like, there's three, ty- three camps of people. Well, okay, four. The camp number one hasn't read any high fantasy books. <laughs> you know, that's just one. That exists. There's the camp that has only read George R. R. Martin which is not me. There's a camp that has only read Robert Jordan. Their, their worlds are different, but they're considered competing since they were being developed at the same time. And the books are published really similarly on the same kind of schedule, which is me. And then there's one that's read, read them both. The thing is, is that I really don't want to read George R.R. R. Martin because for me, like I watched three seasons of Game of Thrones and I really wanted to be get into it. I watched three seasons. Don't tell me I didn't give it a fair shot. <laughs> I didn't like it. It was predictable. Who was going to die was, I mean, it was almost a red flag every time. This person's going to die. The how, I couldn't tell you each time, but I knew they were going to die and I knew who was going to kill them. That wasn't entertaining for me. Right. And then when I discovered afterwards, like, oh yeah, he just monitored social media to find out whose favorites, you know, like whose characters are favorites and then he killed them on purpose. I was like, yeah, I mean, that's cool, I guess, but that's totally not what I like in my kind of, you know, fantasy. Where Robert Jordan was like, I don't give a shit what people think. I'm writing the story. (laughs) I like that better. He has his vision. He stuck to it. But I agree, Kat. Joffrey would be a hard role to recover from. That kid played that role so well. That just a picture of him makes my blood boil. And if I ever saw him in person, I would like I'd have my blood boiling. I'd be like, dude, you are absolutely amazing actor. Uh oh. So uh, Christine's phone is dying. <laughs> you don't have it plugged in. No, I'm at the office and I don't have my charger. Oh no! You should always have a charger at the office. We okay? Don't don't judge my life but we only have one phone charger and it's at home. Wow. Okay. So you go to the gas station (laughs) (laughs) right at the counter next to the register. (laughs) I can't tell you how many of those I've been through, but they're cheap. Yeah. And they get the job done and you know, they last about a year and then you have to get a new one. Yeah. I should invest in one for the office. It's like (laughs) the, the wall wart plus the cables, like, Four bucks, five bucks. Too much. Too much. I can't put that on my student loans. I have too much already. Don't you know I bought a house with my education? (laughs) Sacrifice the house with your education. (laughs) Yes. But hey, you pay off those student loans afterwards, you'd be like, look, I was able to deal with this debt. I can buy a freaking house. Right. And they go, okay, now where's... Now, where's the um, the program where I can get forgiveness on this loan? Right? right? <laughs> that, that's got to exist. All right. Well, you know what? It has been absolutely fantastic having you on the podcast. I'm glad you did this. Thank you. I'm yes. very glad to. You I have really a, enjoyed it. You have an open invitation to come back anytime. Oh, thank you. Seriously. Just like if you're like, hey, I'd like to be on your podcast again. Just, yeah, we'll, pff, done. Done deal. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, everybody. So we actually do have a guest scheduled for next week. Yay! We actually have guests Yay! scheduled out for a while now. Um, the next one, we are going to be talking about what it's like working in Child Protective Services with someone that worked in Child Protective Services. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that there are some stories. Oh, Yeah. I mean, you, that's that challenge of you have to do what's in the best interest of the kids, and usually it's do everything possible to keep the kids with the parents because that's usually what's yeah. in the best interest until it's not. So, yeah, this should be a really good episode. 
And then after that is um, the next week is the same fa- the same people, your family, who can break you and fuck you up or also have the power to help fix you. So we're going to discuss the power of family. Followed by the last guest that we have of the, that's booked out is how faith and religion helped him and how faith-based therapy can help. You know what? It's just another tool in the bag. We don't discriminate. We're not purely, you know, um, you know, secular here or whatever. We, we don't do just like, the, oh, no, church, blast. No. You know what? Some people find a lot of peace and find a lot of guidance in religion. So let's discuss it. Some people find themselves in it and they change their entire lives because of it. So let's discuss it. Other than that, I'm E. I'm C. And we'll catch you guys next week. 